My name is Debbie Eisenhut. I'm a board certified general surgeon. I practiced in Salem, Oregon in the US for almost 21 years before going to the mission field in 2007, where I've worked in Pakistan, Liberia, and Cameroon. While I was in Liberia, I was director of Ebola response at ELWA Hospital and prepared our facility for the coming epidemic. So while I don't have official credentials, I do have some experience. I have worked in low resource environments and have at least some idea of what's available. There is a lot that we can do with locally resourced things. I want to encourage all of you that there are a lot of things that we can do to protect our healthcare workers. After some brief introductory comments, I'm going to say a bit about triage, and then I will spend most of the time discussing personal protective equipment, PPE. I'll finish with a few statements on hospital sanitation. Preparation for COVID-19 will require a huge effort by everyone at your institution. It will also take money. And I know that SIM helps to hope with some of the funds for SIM related hospitals uh, so that they can buy the items and make, make them. There are a few things that may need to be shipped in via air freight. However, almost all of the things that I will mention in this session will, I believe, be able to be resourced in your local context. The prevailing attitudes and standards at your hospital are important. <clears throat> in module one of WHO's infection prevention and control manual, it states, if no infection, prevention and control knowledge, system, organization and resources are in place, it is unlikely that a facility is able to respond effectively to an outbreak. So if workers are not already trained to do hand hygiene between patients or clean stretchers between patients or keep the floors clean, you're going to have an extra hard time. <clears throat> and there also needs to be an attitude of accountability. Your workers will need to inter internalize these changes in order to value and follow the new procedures and to value the equipment and keep it at the hospital. What is our goal? I believe that our primary goal has to be to protect our hospital workers. We, we can't focus on preventing transmission in the community, though I'm sure that you are doing some teaching on that already. But if we don't protect our workers, we can't function. So that will be my focus in this discussion. Our most powerful weapon is prayer. When the Ebola epidemic began in, in Liberia, Samaritan's Purse did a survey of 1,000 people in our area. 89% said that Ebola was a hoax. That was very concerning because, as in COVID-19, the behavior of the general population was key to controlling the epidemic. There had to be buy-in by the people to commit to personal hygiene practices and to bring their loved ones into isolation units. An Ebola epidemic cannot be brought into control until at least 70% of Ebola-stricken people are in isolation. We knew that it would take a culture change to control the epidemic. And Liberia was the country worst affected. There seemed to be no hope, but people around the world began to pray. Liberia went from being the worst affected to being the first country to bring the epidemic under control. I believe that this is the result of concerted prayer by God's people all around the world. Cultures don't change on their own overnight. My prayer is that it would be the same with COVID-19. May we all pray. God hears and answers our prayers. Let's mobilize all of our supporters and workers. The first line of defense will be the control of who enters each facility by reducing the number of entrances. Each person who enters, including staff, will need to be triaged by questioning and a temperature check. This is the triage station at my local hospital in Salem, Oregon. And this is the single controlled entrance at ELWA Hospital in Liberia during the Ebola epidemic. Also, the number of caregivers for each patient needs to be controlled, and you will have to restrict visitors. Doctors Without Borders, or MSF, recommended to us that as much as possible, things be visible from the outside. This limits rumors and conspiracy theories. They recommended the use of this orange plastic fencing rather than opaque tarps. Your triage system will need to determine who is admitted and who can be sent home with instructions. Included in the resources is a, doc is a document that I wrote for my church in the American context on how to care for a COVID-19 patient at home. You can write one appropriate for your context and teach it to caregivers. You'll need an isolation ward for respiratory illness. You may never know who actually has COVID-19 as testing may never become available at your hospital. 
the isolation ward will require good distancing between patient beds and education of caregivers on hygiene and behavior. So what about personal protective equipment or PPE as we call it? There are two types of PPE that I will discuss. One is for droplet spread infection. This is gobs of, of, of uh, material like mucus that only go about six feet and then drop to the ground or land on surfaces. The other is for aerosol spread infection. And this is where the particles remain suspended in the air and could be inhaled by someone else in the room. Information and knowledge about COVID-19 are evolving rapidly. But still, the thought is, uh, uh, is that it was, is primarily spread via droplets and direct contact in the same way that influenza, colds, norovirus, and Ebola are spread. So protective measures that work against those infections should work against COVID-19. PPE against this type of spread is what will be mostly needed for your facilities. Now COVID-19 can be aerosolized in certain situations and special PPE is needed for those. This PPE includes tightly fitting goggles for the eyes and N95 masks or special self-contained respir respirator units. Procedures that produce aerosols include mechanical ventilation of patients, intubation, bronchoscopy, and administration of CPAP. This is continuous positive pre airway pressure. And also I understand that even nebulized treatments um, um, uh, aerosolize the virus. I suggest that these procedures only be used if the following three criteria can be met. One, there is the ability to test all patients with respiratory illness and the ability to isolate those patients from others. And two, the ward or ICU where suspicious or confirmed patients are ventilated or are given CPAP is separate from the rest of the COVID-19 suspicious or confirmed cases. Otherwise, workers and caregivers caring for the other patients will be at risk. And three, there must be a good supply of PPE adequate for aerosolized spread. This will include tightly fitting goggles and N95 face masks or higher. And frankly, most mission hospitals in resource poor areas will not likely be able to meet these criteria. In the nursing home in Kirkland, Washington in the United States, where so many elderly people died, the first responders were treating the patients with CPAP, not realizing that they could be COVID-19 patients. It was considered best practice for respiratory illness by the local fire department. They were even using special filters to reduce the spread of infection. But even with this precaution, COVID-19 spread rapidly to the other patients in the nursing home. The American Society of Anesthesiologists on February 23rd issued guidelines discouraging the use of CPAP for COVID-19 patients because of this risk. And in Toronto, during the SARS crisis, half of all infections were in healthcare workers who were exposed to aerosolized virus through the use of positive pressure airway machines. Anesthesiologists in Singapore cared for the COVID-19 positive intubated patients while wearing full body suits and using respiratory breathing packs. They even clamped into tracheal tubes when changing the ventilator. So you'll have to fully discuss, discuss this in your healthcare setting. Over and over again, of missionary doctors expressing concern about the coming COVID-19 epidemic because they only have one or two ventilators in their hospital. My recommendation is not to use them at all during this time unless you can meet the three criteria that I have listed. This will be difficult and everyone in your hospital will need to understand this. Otherwise, you run the risk of putting your entire critical care staff, doctors, nurses, and housekeepers, out of commission by illness or even death. But what about PPE for droplet spread infection? This is PPE that nearly every facility and resource poor areas can provide, can provide to its workers. It may not look fancy, like the bunny suits that everyone sees on TV, but it will work, and you will need to educate your workers that it will. Sometimes magical qualities can be attributed to the wearing of PPE. Only constant and thorough education and constant monitoring will counteract this. During the Ebola epidemic, I walked through the ER and saw nurses in full PPE gathered around the blood splattered table on which patients were placed to start their IVs. Donuts were on the table. They had taken off their masks and were eating the donuts with their gloved hands. 
and I, real, I realized that a lot more training was needed. So just providing PPE to your workers will not work unless it's used properly. There is nothing magic about PPE. In making PPE for your workers, think, what will protect us from droplets? COVID-19 is not Ebola. There we had to deal frequently with large amounts of vomit and diarrhea. With COVID-19, that is less likely to happen. And if it does, caregivers will usually take care of it. So we will need to protect our workers, mainly from droplets, not large amounts of body fluids. I believe that a hat of some sort, a face shield, possibly a mask, and we will talk about the pros and cons of masks later, a gown, an apron, gloves, and possibly boots should be sufficient for workers doing direct patient care in the isolation unit. Let's talk about each item individually. They will need a hat, a bouffant hat or paper hat, such as that used in surgery should be sufficient, or make some, some out of cloth and elastic. Cloth and elastic are available everywhere in Africa. They'll need a face shield. Now, here in the US, I found these face shields at Home Depot and Lowe's. But I also purchased some hard hats and plastic sheeting and made some face shields like this. All over Africa, I've seen workers wearing plastic hard hats. I've also seen rolls of plastic sheeting in hardware stores. It's displayed with the rolls of table coverings and floor coverings. The plastic sheeting needs to be rigid enough that it doesn't blow around when the person breathes or when there's a breeze. But if it's too thick, the worker can't see well through it. You can see that the plastic sheeting that I have used is less than a millimeter thick. I used a hot glue gun to make my homemade face shield. It worked very well and was easy. But tubes of silicone glue like this, along with the matching metal guns, are available in African markets. Now for my first attempt, I crenellated the plastic sheeting, meaning that I cut triangles out of the edge and glued it to the brim of the hard hat. This did make the plastic sheeting conform well to the brim, but it put the sheeting too close to my face. It was hot and hard to breathe, and you can see that the shield fogs up. So for the second prototype, I first glued the plastic sheeting across the front of the brim of the hard hat. I'm using a piece of paper here so you can see it better. Then I simply folded the, the sheeting over at the corners, leaving bubbles. <clears throat> Here's the actual hard hat I made that way. It may not have looked as, not, as nice because there are little bubbles, some bubbles in the plastic sheeting, but it caused the sheeting to be further from my face. It was comfortable and didn't fog up. Here you can see the comparison. On the left, I'm fogging up and can't breathe and I'm hot. On the right, I can breathe, the shield doesn't fog up, and I'm comfortable. I cut the plastic into pieces measuring 10 by 16 inches. The shield is beveled on the side so that I can turn my head and not have the shield bump into my shoulders. Now I've cut a piece of paper so you can see what I mean. And 10 inches is plenty long. If the shield is too long, the worker can't bend his head down to look uh, without the shield bumping into the chest. So experiment a bit and see what works for you. If you use the face shields made from hard hats, you, won't, you probably will not need cloth hats. <coughs> at my lo local hospital here in Salem, Oregon, they are making homemade face shields out of plastic sheeting, elastic, strips of foam, and staples. And these shields are cheap and work well. Here you can see the ladies on the left cutting out the plastic pieces, and the men on the right are doing the stapling. Each worker has issued his own face shield so that they won't disappear, disappear out the door. Either type of face shield can be sanitized by wiping it down with or dipping it into disinfectant. Your workers will need a gown. Cloth surgical gowns will work very well. <clears throat> so buy lots of sturdy cotton fabric in the market, hire tailors, and set them to replicating your surgical gowns. Surgical gowns have doubled fabric in the sleeves and also in the front from the neck to the upper thighs. Getting the cotton knitted cuff material is challenging in a place like Africa, but the gowns don't have to have knitted cuffs. Now surgical gowns can be laundered about 50 times before they wear out, but before laundering them, first put them in the garbage cans filled with disinfectant to protect your laundry staff. The laundry capabilities of your hospital may quickly become overwhelmed. You could hire more laundry workers if you had the funds, or there's another option, though it's less aesthetically pleasing. In some Ebola units, they didn't launder the scrubs using their workers. They soak the scrubs in garbage cans filled with disinfectant 
and then hung them on lines to dry. And knowing how stinky and sweaty my scrubs got after just a short time in PPE, that doesn't sound very nice, but it isn't dangerous. So unless your gowns have visible soiling, you could just dip them, hang them to dry, and eliminate the laundering process. At my former hospital in Salem, Oregon, they are making disposable gowns out of rolls of thin plastic sheeting and duct tape. They don't look fancy, but they protect the worker just fine. So you will have to educate your workers that homemade gowns protect them against droplet spread infection just as well as the fancy bunny suits they see on TV. Raincoats or rain gear also work. A hospital near us in Liberia admitted a few Ebola patients. They cared for them only using raincoats and no worker got Ebola. And maybe you can think of something else that's just as ingenious. Everyone involved in direct patient care will need an apron, but other workers may not need them. In most markets, markets, you can buy rolls of fake leather made of cloth-backed vinyl. I wear these routinely during surgery, so have your army of tailors sew you some aprons. They should cover the tops of boots if they're worn. You can make the aprons with ties at the neck so that they can be removed without having to fit it over the head and risk touching the face of the worker. Let's see what works best for you. I think that gloves may be the item that will be hardest for you to find. You will need lots of them. I will suggest a way to reduce usage. Each worker <clears throat> uh, uh, doing direct patient care in the isolation unit will need to wear two pairs because about 20% of new surgical gloves have tiny holes in them. Sterile surgical gloves on the right are longer at the wrist than exam gloves uh, that you see on the left, so they are less likely to come out of the sleeves, but they are more expensive. And you may only have exam gloves. If you have both, maybe you could use surgical gloves as the inner pair and exam gloves as the outer pair. Only you know your resource limitations. Duct tape the inner pair of gloves to the sleeve of the PPE so that when the worker stretches out his arm, the sleeve doesn't pop out of the glove. Tear the duct tape in half lengthwise to make it last longer. And fold over the duct tape on the end to leave a tab so that it can be removed easily. If duct tape is not easily sourced in your country, perhaps that is something that can be sent via air freight. Here you can see Nancy Wrightball helping Kent Brantley, Brantley tape his gloves. Make thumb holes in the cuffs of your gown so that the sleeves don't slide out. The duct tape helps, of course, but thumb holes add extra protection. Even simple sewing machines in Africa often can do zigzag stitches, so you can use this feature to make the thumb holes. Now, after the first pair of gloves is duct taped to the sleeve of the gown, the worker puts on a second pair of gloves. In Ebola units, we didn't change gloves between patients. We simply disinfected our gloves after each act of patient care. We had lidded plastic buckets on wooden stands fitted with spigots and filled with chlorine solution. Buckets caught the drainage. All of this can be sourced in most markets in Africa. Your housekeepers will be kept busy filling and emptying these buckets. Now change, so changing gloves between patients actually risks dislodging the inner gloves. So sanitizing the outer gloves between patients rather than changing them will probably be safer and will also reduce glove usage. Your workers in the isolation unit will need to wear boots. If they wear their own footwear, any droplets on that footwear will be carried home to their families. PVC boots work, work well and are available uh, everywhere in Africa. What about masks? I think say this for last as it's the most, it's the most, the most difficult issue. <coughs> With face shields, the worker should not need to wear masks, but they might not feel protected. But there are disadvantages to providing masks. Salem Hospital asked the community to make 10,000 disposable masks out of the polypropylene fabric that is used to wrap surgical instruments. But in the resource poor context, you could only make reusable cloth masks. While a mask might make the worker feel more protected, it increases the likelihood that the worker will reach up and adjust it, contaminating his face. Providing masks will increase the teaching and monitoring needed. In a hot and humid environment, the mask makes glasses more likely to fog up. The mask can also ride up into the worker's eyes. Taping the mask at the nose with adhesive tape helps, but the fogging issue is not easily solved. Doffing or taking off the mask is also an issue. The ties of the polypropylene mask at Salem Hospital are notched so that they break easily. The safest way to doff a mask is to grab it by the front with sanitized gloved hands and yank. The strings break and the worker throws the mask into the garbage can. 
but you can't do that with a reusable cloth mask. After the worker doffs the face shield, he must somehow then get the mask off. If there are elastic ear loops, the worker must fuss between, behind his ears to remove the mask. If he wears glasses and grab, grabs the mask from the front with sanitized gloved hands and yanks, his glasses could be dislodged. If the mask is tied, the helper would, with sanitized gloved hands, have to untie the mask for the worker. If the worker himself unties the math, mask with gloved, sanitized hands, then the sleeves of the contaminated gown might touch his face. So there are significant disadvantages to wearing masks in addition to face shields. Face shields alone are adequate, but education of your workers is needed about that. And if you do provide cloth face masks, you will need to solve these extra problems so that your workers are protected. If you choose to offer ventilator management, CPAP, and intubation to your COVID-19 patients, you will need a separate isolation unit that is physically isolated from the regular COVID-19 isolation units. And all workers in that special unit, including the housekeepers, would need to wear PPE that protects against aerosolized infections. Tyvek bunny suits would be nice, but cloth hats, cloth gowns, aprons, gloves, and boots are just fine. But you also need tightly fitting goggles and N95 masks or special respirators. Face shields alone or plastic safety glasses like you see on the right do not protect the eyes from aerosolized virus. Actual goggles like you see on the left are needed. In hot climates, goggles are very uncomfortable and fog up easily. Anti-fog sprays are available, but in Liberia where the temperature and humidity were in the 90s, they didn't work well. We would put a very tiny drop of Dawn dish detergent on the inside of the goggles and smeared it, all, smeared it all over. It worked for a limited time. And if you choose to offer this type of care, you might consider offering, offering Tyvek hoods to give added protection. Workers wearing this type of PPE in a hot environment can only work for 45 minutes to an hour before they have to doff and rest. It would be hard to run an ICU with that amount of worker turnover. Only you know what your facility can handle, but adding a unit that offers intubation, ventilation, and CPAP treatment adds an extra layer of complexity, expense, and risk. So let's talk, talk about donning and doffing the PPE, putting it on and taking it off. Even the simplest PPE needs a protocol for removing it. Simply provide, providing equipment does not protect the worker. Significant training is needed. <clears throat> Donning or putting on the PPE is not a solar procedure. Whenever a worker is in PPE, a helper needs to be nearby. That helper helps the worker don the PPE, inspects it before he enters the work area, and then helps him doff it or take it off when he leaves the work area. The helper needs to be always there, not just available when called. That means that a helper is needed for every ward or area where PPE is worn and every ward or area will need a station and equipment for doffing. Workers wearing PPE never work in a unit alone so that they can keep an eye on each other. Workers in a special isolation unit who are wearing the full costume will need to doff several times per shift so that they can go to the bathroom, get a drink, or eat lunch. During an eight-hour shift, a worker will need two rest breaks plus a lunch break. This requires four sets of PPE per shift per worker. To doff, the worker goes to the doffing station where the helper is waiting. The protocol is posted on the wall so that the helper can read it off. I know from experience that after wearing PPE for a few hours that I'm very tired and I'm not thinking clearly. The helper reads off, reads off the instructions out loud. The worker repeats the instructions out loud while performing them. And you will have to work out your own protocol depending on what type of PPE you provide to your workers. The order of removing the items may vary. There is a sample protocol in the list of resources. The protocol at first glance may seem complicated, but it really isn't. Notice that the items are removed one by one, taking care not to touch bare skin or inside clothing. After doffing each item, the worker sanitizes his gloved hands before proceeding on to the next step, and the inside gloves are almost always taken off last. Figure out your protocol, train each worker on it, and stick to it. I won't go over the sample donning and doffing protocol here as it would take too much time. You can read it yourself. <clears throat> what do you do with the soiled PPE? Well, after the doffing, the reusable items are left to soak for 15 minutes. The boots can be dried by hanging them upside down on sticks pounded into the ground. 
The aprons are hung on clotheslines. The cloth gowns and hats are either sent to be laundered and dried, or they're simply hung up, hung up to dry. And the face shields are wiped down and laid out to dry. You might ask your workers to bring a clean set of clothing to work. They could wash their hands, arms, and faces after work and put on the clean clothing. You could also offer them showers, depending on what your facility can handle. They can dip their used work clothing in a garbage can full of disinfectant and take it home and wash it. This way, they reduce the risk of taking the virus home to their families. Who at your hospital actually needs PPE? You certainly won't have every worker in your hospital wearing a cloth hat, face shield, cloth gown, apron, gloves, and boots. Those directly doing patient care should, and certainly those who are working in the respiratory isolation unit should wear the full costume. But clerks and cashiers, maintenance workers, you'll have to sit down and figure out how to, de how to deploy your PPE at your facility. During Ebola, I took care of two hospital cashiers who contracted Ebola during the course of their work. Both of them died. Remember that money is probably the dirtiest thing out there. <clears throat> if your cashier's office has a plexiglass shield, they don't need to wear face shields, but they should wear gloves. But remember, even the simplest PPE requires, to, requires teaching and how to use it and how to doff it. Don't just hand them two boxes of gloves and walk away. Equipment without proper training is not PPE. They need to be taught how to sanitize their gloves, take them off properly, and then wash their hands. And they need to be taught to not eat at their workstations. So thoughtfully deploy your PPE in your hospital and provide the necessary training, monitoring, and enforcement so that your workers are protected. What about taking vital signs and examining patients in your isolation unit? When I'm wearing my face shield, it is hard to use my stethoscope without contaminating my face with my gloved hands. In the Ebola units, we took systolic blood pressures only by palpation. That's what the worker on the left is doing. And we used battery powered wall clocks to take pulses and respiratory rates because we couldn't use our watches. That's what the worker on the right is doing. You also probably won't be able to auscult auscultate the lungs. Could a handheld of septic Doppler be used? I don't know. You will have to experiment. Charting is a problem in the isolation unit too. Consider having scribes for your workers. Here Kent Brantley is using Elizabeth as a scribe, giving her the vital signs, orders, and other data. At, the time of, at that time, of course, we didn't know to call her a scribe. <clears throat> Or maybe you'll have a laptop in your isolation unit and your workers can chart on that. This is the time when hospital sanitation and worker hygiene will determine how protected your workers are. Here are a few suggestions. Ask every person, staff member, patient or caregiver to wash his hands on entering the ward using chlorine solution or simple soap and water. Either is effective. Expect them to wash their hands after giving patient care. Laundry powder, often called Omo in Africa, is surprisingly gentle on the hands. In my home in Africa, I purchase hand soap dispensers, and then when they're empty, I refill them with water and a tablespoon of laundry powder. It is cheap and more sanitary than using bars of soap. Maybe this would work for you. Consider having a hand washing champion on each shift. Your champion would go around the hospital teaching caregivers proper hygiene and supervising a regular schedule of hand washing for the workers on each ward. In Mingo Baptist Hospital in Cameroon, they make their own sanitizer out of rubbing alcohol and glycerin. Both are sourced in Cameroon. As we all know now, hand sanitizer is made with grain alcohol. If you can get it in your country, buy the stuff that is, that is, that is at least 120 proof, 60% alcohol, and make hand sanitizer out of that. But remember, the hand washing still is more effective than hand sanitizer. You use hand sanitizer only if hand washing is not possible. Can you step up your hospital sanitation protocol? Increase the frequency of mopping and sanitation of surfaces. Clean stretchers and wheelchairs between each use. Increase the frequency of cleaning the latrines. Don't forget doorknobs, handrails, nurse's station countertops, exam tables, and phones. Perhaps the funds uh, that you get can be used to hire the extra personnel needed for this. Bleach and chlorine solution or any suitable disinfectant will work. Bleach works well, but for a large hospital, you'll burn through a lot of it. During the Ebola epidemic, we used swimming pool chlorine, uh, the, the powder, as recommended by MSF. And the MSF manual is included in the resources so that you can see how to mix it. 
perhaps you could find at some, it's at the large uh, hotels in the large cities that have swimming pools, or maybe it could be shipped in via air freight. That's all that I have. Thank you very much for your attention.